You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch in and um, I'll just introduce you and let's just, let's get into the questions, huh? How's okay, sound? sounds good. Yep. All right. Uh, we're with uh, Magdalene uh, Dykstra. Magdalene is an artist uh, actually up in the province of uh, Ontario, uh, Canada. She's based in St. Catharines, which is uh, which is actually near um, Niagara on the Lake. And Magdalene, I told you that no Matt Niagara on the Lake is actually where I got married years ago. Uh, beautiful, a beautiful area. Um, actually, be our first guest uh, from. From Canada, and I just wanted to welcome you on the show, Magdalene Dykstra. Thank you so much, Ken. I'm looking forward to it. One of the first questions we ask is to just kind of go way back and um, just kind of wondering what you were like as a young human. Um, were you always an artist? Uh, were you interested in artistic things? And what, in general, what were you like? How do you see yourself back then? Um, I was an awkward kid. Um, I remember playing a lot with my younger sister and we would entertain ourselves just making up games as kids do. Um, Some of my earliest memories of consciously creating um, are back in grade school. I remember um, staying up really late with my bedside light on and working on this pointillist landscape for some assignment for school. And like, you know, as a kid, you don't stay up late with your bedside light on for homework that like you don't stay up late in bed past your bedtime to do math homework. So I remember that was a it was a fun like it was something I wanted to spend time on. Um, I remember um, this is a weird memory, but I remember drawing a horse in like grade seven, maybe or grade six. And uh, a classmate of mine tried to draw a horse, too, and couldn't quite get there. And I was like, yeah, I got that. I did that. (laughs) So you just um, felt you just felt that you feel like kind of maybe a natural ability or an inclination that you could that you could do it well. Yeah. Yeah. I think I felt like, yeah, it was a way I could carve out a little identity for myself in that moment. Um, Yeah. My peer to peer relationships weren't easy as a kid like I tended to have one or two friends at a time um because that seemed to be all I could handle so uh (laughs) yeah um yeah I think it was a a matter of carving out a little space for myself um and then all through high school I I took art classes and it was a peaceful place for me to be um And then that ultimately led me to continuing it in university, even though the plan was to become a doctor, like my mom. Um, So my plan was to go to school for biology for my um, for my bachelor's degree and then continue on the track to going into medicine. But I was also studying art as a a double degree. And um, yeah, art took over. So uh, that's how it began. What did, um, what did mom think of what I would see to be your related endeavor? (laughs) Yeah, she she wasn't wasn't a fan. It's funny because she was the one who suggested to me that I wouldn't focus, um, on science in undergrad. She said, oh, you love art. Take that too. Um, so I think it bit her in the butt a little bit because, um, (laughs) it was, uh, I think halfway through my third year in undergrad that I knew I was not continuing into medicine and that's the year you're supposed to take the MCAT and uh I'm telling my mom this I'm telling her you know I'm I'm not going to med school it's not happening and she's like well you know just take the test just in case so uh she held out hope I don't think she was too thrilled at the uh the lack of security in an artist's life so uh <laughs> she's supportive now though which is wonderful that that that's great um and, and you mentioned, you know, finding a place or uh, some some security in home, even within high school and in, in the art classes. And you're you're an art uh, teacher, and you've taught at different levels. Um, did you 
you know, I mean, was there particular moments within that environment that really kind of were formative for you in deciding to actually teach art? Um, no. <laughs> uh, I remember there were several sort of hazy memories that would, I think, piece together to contribute to me going into education. Um, I mean, one clear memory I have is Mrs. Knapp, who was my, I think, grade eight teacher, or maybe it was younger than that, actually. Um, I remember one day she she held up my, uh, I think it was a rock sculpture assignment or something like that, and she held up my assignment and said, good job, and, you know, this is really well done, um, and just feeling validated by Mrs. Knapp, my teacher, was an extremely, obviously extremely powerful. I'm still talking about it. <laughs> um, but but uh, getting into education was actually, um, yeah, it wasn't like a, a, a really dramatic, powerful decision that I made to get into education. It just kind of ended up happening. And as far as um, the, the the types of art uh, that that you create, um, we're going to do a deeper dive in a little bit as far as your process for working with clay and what you've been doing with that. But just in, in general, as you developed, were there particular um, art styles you like to create and like to joy, enjoy as a consumer or a, a viewer of art? Yeah. Um, one of... I think one of the works that has always um, stood out in my memory was uh, one of Robert Motherwell's um, Elegy to the Spanish Republic. It's, an, it's one of the abstract expressionist school. And it uh, the one that I saw was at the Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo. And uh, it was this larger than life painting. And I was, I was, I think still in high school and I didn't know any of the ideas behind this painting or behind the movement or anything like that. But I remember just being stopped in my tracks in front of this painting. And it must've been something like 10 feet tall by, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 feet wide, something like that. But it completely swallowed me up. And um, even though I was totally self-conscious about, just stopping, and I actually had to sit down on the gallery floor. I, I couldn't really leave the painting. Um, and I just remember being struck by these massive um, sort of swaths of black that blocked out all the color in the background. And um, without being able to articulate it at that time, I think I was experiencing a, a sort of emotional resonance with what... Motherwell was thinking about, maybe not thinking about in terms of like, uh, it's not as though my experience and his experience would have had um, conscious connections, but I think there was an emotional connection with, um, like his work was about grieving what was happening in Spain at the time. And um, yeah, so works like Motherwell's Elegy series have always stopped me in my tracks. Um, but I had a similar moment like that with um, one of Mark Rothko's paintings. I couldn't tell you which one, which colors. I just re remember I got closer and closer to this like seemingly super simple square slash rectangle of color, but I kept getting closer and closer to it until I could allow my peripheral vision to sort of fuzz out <laughs> um, that color just kind of bent around my entire field of vision. Um, yeah. So my, my recent research has gone back to those intense experiences with, um, those abstract painters. I, uh, I love your description, um, which is kind of, uh, you know, re revealing of just being, in the museum and you're describing the, you know, the emotion and trying to grapple with that and how it impacted you, you know, physically like laying down and you see the gestures that people make in museums. I'm fascinated. 
I am really fascinated by museum goers. I mean, for me, I realized years ago that it was kind of a, there was a spiritual aspect of art museums uh, for me that you you know what I mean? And um, I had conversations from that point where, you know, people describe it very similarly. I, I know for sure that when believers go to church, they're having some sort of similar experience that yeah. I am uh, g- going to a museum. And mm-hmm. it's it. I find the, uh, you know, who's going to the museum, the patrons, to be very interesting in the sense of, like, why are they there? And, like, are they going too close to the painting, which that's my only problem. I try to get like, I want to live in it. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, You're one of those rule breakers. Like you go across the rope. I try, I try not to, I really do. And I'm saying this to all, you know, uh, to everybody, You're not supposed to do that, but I know yeah. that I push it cause I just want to see what I can get out of it. Um, yeah. and it's that, it's the emotion. It's just trying to be enveloped. Um, within that. So those type of experiences for you help, I'd imagine, were just uh, transformative as far as the power that that art held over you. But um, is that why you create? Or can you answer the question why you create art yourself? Um, That's such a, it's a hard question. Life would be a lot easier if I didn't insist on doing this. I think uh, I think there's something about wanting to see an idea that's in my head as this foggy, um, barely there sort of image, but the only way I can see it is to actually make it because it's this weird foggy idea that's in my head isn't hasn't been I've never seen it before. So there's something of that. Um, I, uh, I, I am drawn to works, to artworks that have a feeling of they could completely absorb you, just swallow you up and float you, uh, float you in, in their color or in their just massive scale. Um, so I think there is something of that in, in the way I try to make my work. Um, I think there's also something about just insisting on I am here. Um, I, uh, I've been looking back into um, some of the earliest art forms, the cave paintings, and one of the things that just absolutely stopped me in my tracks, it wasn't the paintings of animals on the rocks, which we're all kind of used to by now, but I recently learned about these handprints and these silhouettes of hands in caves around the world but the ones that I had encountered I think were in a cave in France and it just struck me as like there's all sorts of theories about whether this was part of a ritual and this and that but without looking into all that what struck me was it was just the most foundational way of saying I was here this is my mark and it really it really struck a chord with me. And I think uh, there's something about that in making art that it's, especially in making something that has some physical presence, it's it's saying, I'm here, I am worth looking at, I am visible, I deserve to be seen. I, I, I really, I really uh, connect to what you say there. Um, you know, I've been doing this podcast for a bit in the, you know, trying to define what art is. And I have a very extremely rudimentary sense of it. And it connects to some of the words you just used. For mm-hmm. me, art is, is, is like three words, it seems right now. Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, look at this. And I'm, it, it, just look at this. And there's a component I hear from, from what you're saying. It's like worthy mm-hmm. of memory. I existed. Here it is. There's something to look at. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a, I don't know, maybe a primitive aspect uh, to, to that. But I want to, I want to, using the word primitive, I want to talk to you about um, your, your exhibit. And I want to try to give the listeners, you're going to help me with this, um, give them a sense of, you know, what it is about, about your art, because you work in a unique field. I'm going to read 
uh, the, you have an exhibit uh, as part of um, some artists who work with clay uh, in Toronto at the Gardner Museum. And the museum, uh, the exhibit itself is called Raw. I'm going to read to you about um, Raw and Clay. And after I read this, I, I want I want you to take us into a deeper dive as far as how you work with Clay and what what you create uh, now. <laughs> so it states that Raw Clay is emerging as a compelling medium for contemporary art, taking on new relevance as conversations about around identity, visibility, and survival on our planet develop. From sticky to, and wet to dry and powdery, raw clay speaks to primal themes like the land, the body, and memory. Perhaps most significantly, clay reaffirms our essential connection to the earth. As digital screens come to dominate our vision and disconnect us from an increasingly threatened environment, Clay takes on a critical role in, was, in resisting our withdrawal into the virtual. Mm -hmm. um, clay is seen, this is me talking now, not, no, not mm -hmm. the guard. <laughs> clay is, you know, it, it has this uh, primitive component, it seems, um, mm -hmm. you know, elemental almost. It, tell us how you work with clay and what you create. Um. So what I do is I form clay into um, microbial forms. So what I do is I, I look at microscopic photography, um, microscopic images, and, and uh, the method I've used to develop my work is that based on those images, um, I'll form, I'll take clay and I'll form um, a simplified template, um, maybe five inches by five inches. And, uh, I'll pour a plaster mold of that, which will capture the hundreds, if not thousands of individual cells that I've formed on this original, on this template. And then using that plaster mold, um, I form, uh, large installations or wall sculptures, that uh, continue to build on that idea of cellular accumulation. So in the installation at the Gardner Museum, for example, there are um, several modules of microbial growth that appear to be coming out of the wall. Um, for my wall sculptures, uh, they're on panels, so they speak the language of painting being on a, a sort of confined space of that panel. Um, and then I leave all my work raw, um, which is why I'm in raw at the Gardner Museum. Um, for me, what that is, is about thinking about my individual transience and um, also our transience as a species, especially as climate change becomes more and more of a pressing concern. Um, I, I try to have hope. I'm not a naturally hopeful person, um, but uh, it, the more we learn about climate change and the more we see the consistent um, resistance of our institutions and our governments to actually dealing with it in a meaningful way, I, I don't, I, I struggle to have hope that our species will be able to stick around forever. <laughs> Yeah, so, and I, I, and and I want to, if you pardon me, just jumping in there because you know I've had two or three guests, and all these things are are, are you know just just deeply related, right? And uh, I found that the artists that I've interviewed who you know depict you know animals or maybe something within nature in your what I would say elemental creations that 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 you do you know, there's a connection to those forms of life and processes uh, that are threatened. Um, and I, I believe within that, then art, the art has this, you know, very distinct role. It's either within advocacy or there's even the discussion of artists have always dealt with in times of political turmoil or crisis or possible, you know, uh, a crisis of the magnitude with climate change, that artist's role is 
you know, both threatened and amplified, right? You're in a unique role to say, holy shit, take a look at like what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. Or on the other hand, you know, it's being like, why are you creating art, man? Everything's burning, right? So yeah. Yeah. Um, you end up being, I, I feel that you're, you must feel squarely placed uh, with within that dynamic of what to do right now. Is it, do, mm-hmm. do you feel the same way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I don't make art to make a political statement. That's never been my, my push. Um, but I think to do something like this is, I I don't think you can get away from making some sort of statement, some sort of value statement, like to do to make the the work I'm making, it's a very, it's it's not meant to be sold necessarily. Although you know I could compromise on that, <laughs> but like the installation at the Gardner Museum, for example, that's not a saleable product. So it didn't it it stands in the face of the model we're living in, which is the things you spend your time on should have monetary value. That's how we've been taught to survive, right? You get a job, you spend your time on that job that gives you money to buy food and then numb out on Netflix. Um, So I think even though I'm not necessarily driven to make my work based out of a a needing to make a political statement, I think there is something inherently political in making this work. Um, But I will, I'll acknowledge, like I've been reading more about, um, land artists who have gone before me. So artists who are citing their work out in the wilderness, out in the landscape and, or, um, making work that has to do with that, with that land. And, uh, there's quite a range within those artists, but, um, I've been learning about some artists who are, who have worked with scientists and have use their voice as artists in collaboration with those scientists to um, highlight important information in regards to um, climate change and environmental catastrophe. Um, And I I see that work and I think, oh, maybe I should make work like that. But I know deep down that is not what I'm driven to make. And it, it wouldn't be as much as I'm concerned about climate change. It's not what I'm authentically driven to make. So the tension between um, using my artwork to say, holy shit, like, this is a disaster. Like, right, we need to right. look at this. And it, the tension between, between that side and, um, I don't know, what's the other side? Like, just... I, I've never, for the longest time, I've never been able to just make a pretty picture that can sell. Um, you know, not throwing any shade on on people who do that. It's just not where I am able to operate. Um, so I don't well, know. There's somewhere in between. I'm trying to find where I can be in the space between an overtly activist artist and an artist who is disengaged, disengaging whether from self-preservation or just needing to heal from all the tension and anger we are living with right now. Um, I'm trying to find a space in the middle somewhere. Yeah. And I understand, I understand that. And those are great questions. And and how much of it is in your control? I mean, if you think, let let me, we we talked a little bit previously, and this is the, this is what I want to focus on. I was fascinated when you're describing some parts of, again, going back to your process and going back to the art itself, where both within your work, we're at the raw exhibit, you know, there's going to be um, uh, pieces that you add to it. And then there are other artists there where it, it's clear that the art itself is changing on a physical, chemical level beyond ways that I understand as the exhibit goes on. So there we're talking about an artist who set those things into motion, but also can't predict the exact mm-hmm. outcomes of how things appear and, and they show themselves. Mm-hmm. Tell, I like, I, I'm just, just overwhelmed and fascinated by the idea of how 
a, an art piece is created and how it develops on its own in that space. Can you talk a little bit about how, yes, you're setting up that display and how the artwork itself made out of clay that you do um, will change over time? Mm -hmm. um, well, for the raw exhibition, um, my installation will essentially, it will continue to grow in scale. So, um, Right now, it is pretty dominant in a just off center uh, place on this wall. So this wall is 35 feet wide and um, just off, off to the left of center, there's a, a fairly dominant collection of mass of my cellular accumulation. And then there's, uh, there are a couple of thinner bits of accumulation on either side of that. Um, so what I'll be doing throughout the exhibition period is continuing to add. So my plan is to um, not only continue to fill up that one wall, but even jump to another location in the gallery to suggest a continuing spread of infection. Um, the, uh, the root idea for the installation in RAW was, it came from a book written by James Lovelock. He's an independent scientist and environmentalist out of the UK. And uh, he, um, the book that I read by him was called The Vanishing Face of Gaia. He was, um, he's been best known for his Gaia hypothesis, which um, puts forth the idea that the earth is essentially a living system, just like a human body. And uh, all the systems, all the systems within the living earth work together to maintain balance. But just like a human body, it can get sick when things are out of balance. And so from there, he coined this new term called polyanthropanemia. Poly meaning many, anthro referring to humans. And panemia, just to add a disease tone on the end. Um, like if you think of anemia, that's the disease of having too little iron. So it's taking that... Um, Sure. suffix and adding yeah. on yeah. um so that's that's where my installation idea came from was what what if the earth started taking over the gallery space what if the immune system started pushing in to the gallery space and if that was the case it would continue to grow and spread until it would ultimately completely dominate that space and take it back um so that's why my installation will continue to grow. It'll continue to accumulate more and more modules and more and more staining on the walls. And this will take what 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 are the um what the exhibit dates again for um the raw exhibit? Right. So it officially opens March fifth. Uh, so in just over a week, I think that is now, and it runs to June seventh. All right. Um, it, it, I, 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 like I, since I first started talking, I've been fascinated with the kind of the changing art um, and just the dynamic of change. When we think of art, I think a lot of times we're talking about maybe a slice in time or a photograph, you know, capturing a moment, you know, and creating some permanence around it. And I think the challenging idea always is when there's a dynamic piece of art, um, you know, that, that changes formally in ways that, that you can see that, you know, that you can see. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to find out what your theory of art is, of what it is. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you what, what is art? Uh, it's very big. <laughs> um, the more I learn, the more I can't put a fine line around that. Um, like, I, I forget the artist's name, but I was learning, uh, I was reading a little bit about conceptual art, and um, apparently there was an artist who said that something like every shoe shop in, I think it was New York, uh, was his artwork. He, the artist just claimed that. And I mean, I mean, that's the foundation of conceptual art. It's the idea rather than the execution. Um, so what is art? It, it's, it's continually shifting. Um, 
I mean, for me, art is a way of um, meditating on how I fit in to this world. So the reason I use cellular accumulation is to have an aesthetic that allows me to think about myself as an individual cell and every other human individual as an individual cell, and then to visualize my place in that massive accumulation. And, and for me, I find comfort in that, um, in knowing that, oh, okay, all the things I'm stressing about, it's okay, because it's all this little cell, it's not a big deal, it, it all passes. Um, just sort of remember your not remember your place in terms of like disciplining a child, <laughs> but just have context for how you fit into the big picture. Um, so yeah, uh, but I think art also has the power to shape the way we then as a, as a species continue to shape our world. Um, I mean, I'm still thinking about Castle's performance this past Thursday on February 20th. And uh, they they talk about um, the issues of visibility for trans people, um, the, the presence of power in being visible and acknowledged, yeah. um, but also the vulnerability in terms of, um, I mean, in most recent events with... Um, bathroom laws and, and in, in forcing trans people to use bathrooms that are quote unquote in line with their birth, uh, birth sex versus their gender of choice. Um, th that's a, an enforced visibility that, that poses risk. Right. right. Um, right. and what I've been impressed with, with Castle's career is their work isn't only making themselves visible as an individual, but they're helping to make visible the concerns of their community. And in that way, I, I view Castles as an artist who is um, helping to perhaps change the way we think about things and, and perhaps change the way societies, help to change the way societies move forward. Um, ideally, I think that's what art is, is um, creative gestures that help us to reconsider how we want to be as a species on this planet. Yeah. And then I, and I think there's a component, you know, underlying that I, I know you grappled with intellectually, but just, you know, within that there, there are political components to the, you know, to the choices that we make and, and, and individuals who are represented or not. And I think even within your work, I mean, the fact that you're representing like, you know, earth, right? Like <laughs> bringing that into the, the foreground of, um, of, of your material, uh, that, that you're using. And, um, I think that's, uh, I, I think that's incredible. And I've been really inspired by, you know, your description of the performance that you saw as well, which is um, in Castle, of course, is part of the raw exhibit that, that you're mm -hmm. part of. Mm -hmm. um, I got another question for you. I, I mean, it's clear that in, you know, throughout your life and what you're trying to express and do with with art, it's been, you know, an important part of, you know, your identity. Mm -hmm. um, how does art, in, in your creating art help you help you live your life? Uh, <laughs> um, that's such a hard question. Um, I mean, it, it, it's such a hard question. Part of me wishes I wasn't, uh, that I didn't feel driven to make and then to get my work out into the public sphere. Part of me wishes I could just keep a job and read books and cuddle with my cats and, and husband too. Sure. But, um, <laughs> uh, how does art help me live? I, it's so hard to answer that because it's not, it doesn't feel like a choice anymore. I mean, it always is. I, I suppose I could yeah. shut this down, I guess. 
and I don't know, maybe swap out the studio table for a pool table or something. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, I could talk about how, you know, art is supposed to be very therapeutic and, and I'm not going to deny that, like, especially as a kid, art was my therapy and, um, you know, it's still very, uh, um, sort of balancing, I'll say, for me emotionally. Um, so there's that component. Um, I mean, I think if, even if I wasn't making quote unquote art, um, whatever that continues to evolve to be, I have to have some way of continuing to meditate on how I fit in to the, the mess that we are, um, we being humans. Sure. Um, but, uh, gosh, yeah. I, I well, let me, uh, let me ask you this, this different one. Cause I, I would almost forget to ask the question. I wrote it down earlier, but, um, going back to as far as what you do, right. What you do in life, you're talking about, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, kind of, you'd be a doctor, um, and there was the artist component and then you became an artist, but it seemed very clear to me when you're discussing your artistic, uh, process, it sounded like the process of a, of a, of a doctor examining (laughs) on a, on a cellular (laughs) level. So I think I I could have asked you that question in an interview where it said is like, Oh, what's your, you know, what's your life like as, as a doctor? Tell me about that. And you might've answered Mm -hmm. it very similarly. So as part of your identity. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Now that you bring that up, um, uh, I've been getting to know my mom more like adult to adult and just human to human rather than mom and daughter. Um, and part of that has been understanding that she actually views her profession being a doctor as, uh, quite intuitive. There's a lot of um, just needing to follow her gut. Like, yes, there's the science, but there's so much they don't know. I don't think she would be upset by me saying that. I think, you know, any doctor who's a reasonable human would acknowledge that, that there's still so much they just don't know. Um, and in talking to her about that, I think, uh, she was, she was pointing out to me that there's creativity in that. And, um, so, So I think even if I wasn't an artist, there would be creativity elsewhere. I think any balanced human being finds a way of expressing creativity, whether it's baking, sewing, uh, through medicine, um, packing their kids' lunches. I think we all find ways to express our creativity. I think perhaps the way art has helped me to evolve, let me put it that way, as opposed to live because live is a living's a messy business. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the way being an artist has helped me to evolve is to really force me to let go of control, um, which I fight against every damn day. <laughs> um, and to, I think it's helping me to practice um, living in ambiguity and just not knowing like living in doubt and, and trying to find a way to be okay with that. Um, like when I start an artwork, I may have sketches, I may have scale drawings and plans, but until I was in the Gardner museum installing that, that first stage of the installation, I didn't really know what it was going to look like. And that's terrifying, but, um, you know, either, I get scared and I run away and I don't do it or I feel the fear and acknowledge it and do it anyway. And I think being an artist has helped me to cultivate some more bravery just because it's such, um, it's such a strange thing to do. There's no set path. There's no way, one way to be an artist. You just have to sort of take one step after another and, there's a lot of faith and a lot of trust that comes into that. Yeah, I, 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 our conversations led me to think a lot about the different categories. I mean, even the type of questions asking about art and medicine. And I think, you know, if you look historically, 
when you blur the distinctions amongst, say, professions and inquiries, you'll see kind of like, you know, great, great artists like, uh, you know, Michelangelo and Da Vinci. And you'd see things like anatomy, medicine, you know, early physics, mathematics, art, painting. You know, there was yeah. there was so yeah. many components and there wasn't necessarily the categorization. And I'm as a philosopher, we tend to be. I'm very, very interested in areas where categories either fail or they can be challenged, whether something is this or not that. And because in that ambiguity in in, in some of our conversation, while it makes you feel uncomfortable, that there's a good fertile um, area to to inquire. Um, Mm -hmm. And I've asked you some really tough questions. So I'm going to ask you a super, super easy one. Why is there something rather? No, seriously, why? I'm I'm being facetious, of course, but the big the big the big question I was just going to ask you is, uh, even with all that stuff, why why is there something rather than nothing? You know, um, I think really deep down, it's about asserting, for me anyway, that. I'm here. I uh, I remember being um, up in the uh, the top, like viewing towers of um, one of the cathedrals in Germany. I want to say it was uh, in Cologne, maybe. I don't remember, but um, I remember being so offended when I saw all of these like Joe was here 1994 or something on this incredible structure that that claimed lives in its construction and um was supposed to be dedicated to god uh and and was just this amazing feat and and then you know all these people were just like oh yeah (laughs) l heart m 2002 or something but I think um, that gesture of writing, you know, I was here on the on a, you know, the the viewing station of a cathedral. I don't know how different that is to stenciling your hand in a prehistoric cave, to sure. yeah. drawing, to taking photos that record what you notice, to sculpting strange accumulations of cellular growth using clay. I I really think at the base of it, the reason for me that there's something out of nothing is our drive to assert that we were here for a moment. I I really appreciate that. Um, For some reason, when you were talking, uh, I I did, I did think about this, this, um, you know, this, this painting and, uh, it was a cover of a New Yorker, and I think it was by the artist Adrian Tomine. And there are various places. I know there's one in Paris, and there might be one in the U.S. somewhere where people, you would see lovers, they kind of like put a lock onto um, oh, yeah. like the link, right? So you've yeah. seen or heard of this. And it was this just kind of like dark but fascinating painting where there were couples doing that, and right behind them was the 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 guy with the bolt cutter with the, with the lock cutter and, you know, just kind of cleaning up afterwards. And I just thought there was just this incredible tension within it where people are just saying, Hey, like, you know, we're in love, we exist. We're putting a lock yeah. on this place or, you yeah, know, we're yeah. drawing our names in the cement or in the tree. And, you know, there's other forces saying that's all right. <laughs> we're just going to clear yeah. it out. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Whether it's the bolt cutter or, nature or whatever yeah yeah that's our the next gestures thing. don't last <laughs> that, that's the next thing i was thinking i was nature was the exact next next thing that would kind of clear it out um mm-hmm. and possibly erase what we're trying to say um um uh, magdalene uh i wanted um i've had such a wonderful time talking to you and there's a lot of components of your work that um i think listeners uh in order to get more of a full experience 
uh, would be useful for you to kind of help point them towards how they can connect uh, to your work online and maybe just mention again that uh, exhibit uh, that you're involved in. Um, so can you can you help guide the listeners to, to your work and how they can uh, experience what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my website is MagdalenDykstra.com. So that's M-A-G-D-O-L-E-N-E. D-Y-K-S-T-R-A dot com. And of course, I'm on Instagram. Um, my handle is at Maggie Dykstra, but it's not Maggie the way you would think of spelling it. It's actually M-A-G-I because my middle name is Isis. Um, oh. Yeah, so it's Mag I Dykstra um, on Instagram. And uh, I would really encourage anyone who's listening to check out raw at the Gardner Museum. I think the Gardner's website is, oh, shoot, I think it's gardnermuseum.on.ca. Um, it's, I'm in Toronto, it's in Toronto, correct? It is. So if you just Google, oh, sorry, it's gardnermuseum.com. Oh, great. Um, so G-A-R-D-I-N-E-R museum. Um and uh, like, even if you Google it, Gardner Museum Raw, um, yeah, the uh, I'm sure they'll be posting images of um, the castle's performance. And the other artists included in the show with us are Linda Swanson, whose work I can only describe as visual poetry. It's um, she works with water as it transforms uh, various powders clay powders and um, ingredients that are often put in clay and glazes and um, the water can completes the work for her. She sort of acts as a facilitator for the materials. So there will be images of her work. Uh, and Aza, also Aza El Sadiq is in the exhibit and um, their work deals with um, memory and um, the dissolution of memory uh, so yeah, I would encourage your listeners to check out raw at the Gardner museum. Thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate you mentioned the, uh, the other artists as well as part of that exhibit. Um, cause it seems just, just a, you know, just an incredible living and dynamic, uh, yeah. piece and, um, not it, just to, just to pull it out. Um, ha- Middle name Isis. That's absolutely incredible. That one just went past. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an incredible uh, middle name that you have, and uh, yeah. yeah, I hope I Not hope great timing right now. But um, well, uh, first. you know, actually, my people, grandma had it first. So. People know uh, history and legends, and can extend their thinking yeah. throughout. Uh, they they can get there. <laughs> uh, that's all we need. Uh, Magdalene Dykstra, thank you so much for spending time uh, with us. And I'm going to encourage all listeners to kind of take a look at her work. Um, there's a dynamic component that's just easier to easier to try to see and experience uh, if you can. And Magdalene, just wanted to thank you uh, for your time and for visiting something rather than nothing. Thank you so much, Ken. Thanks for reaching out. Have a great day. To you. Bye bye. You are listening to something rather than nothing.